Uh, I just want to say a very brief welcome to Sean Canty. Super happy to have him back. He's been many, many times in our reviews and is a very important voice at Penn already. Um, I want to thank Andrew Saunders for introducing Sean and want to give the word to Andrew. Go ahead, Andrew. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, welcome. It's really uh, my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Sean Canty. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, Sean Canty has quite a history with the city. I wish you were here in Philadelphia uh, tonight, Sean, uh, but we'll have to take a uh, wink up on the, um, on the, the uh, second invite. I think that'd be great. But um, Sean, uh, Sean is an amazing architect. He actually uh, was born here in Philadelphia and grew up in Germantown. He went to the CHAD, which is the Charter High School for Architecture and Design in Philadelphia and graduated in 2005. He also has worked with a number of our, um, our colleagues here, uh, Scott Erdy at Erdy and McHenry, uh, as well as Brian Phillips at ISA uh, in Philadelphia architecture firms before he moved out to San Francisco. Um, Sean Canty is the founder of Studio Sean Canty. The studio is interested in the, th uh, in the thoughtful transformations of existing architecture, typologies, and geometries as a process of rethinking Quotidian spaces anew. Studio SC is a design practice that activates environments by conjoining discrete geometries, materials, and architectural types. This combinatorial approach invites closer reading of familiar spaces through the oscillation between resolution and contrast. The work of the studio materializes at, very, at a variety of scales, from objects to interiors, and explores a range of programmatic types from domestic environments to cultural spaces. Canty is a designer and assistant professor of architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he teaches architectural design and coordinates the first year core design studios. Prior to joining the faculty at the GSD, Canty held teaching positions at the Cooper Union, University of California, Berkeley, and California College of the Arts. In addition to architectural design, Canty has taught classes on descriptive geometry and design media. Canty is one of the founding principals of Office 303, an experimental architectural collective that spans New York, San Francisco, and Cambridge. Selected as the finalist for the 2016 MoMA PS1 Young Architects Competition, O3 has completed a welcome center for Governor's Island and exhibited work at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Prior to founding these studios, Canty was a project designer at Iwamoto Scott Architecture in San Francisco. With Iwamoto Scott, he led commercial projects with clients including Pinterest, Bloomberg, Heavybit, and oversaw residential projects, including the GoTo House and the No Valley Residence. Canty received an MARC from the University of Graduate School, uh, sorry, University's Graduate School of Design with Preston Scott Cohen as his thesis advisor and a BARC from the College of the California College of the Arts. I was also reading just recently a curbed article, and I'm going to pull some quotes from this curbed article. Uh, early in June, an epic Instagram stories archive, uh, Canty compiled a list of black creatives working in architecture, furniture design, art, fashion, and urban design. He's now created an air table called 200 Black Creators based on the stories to help you discover your next favorite fellow. The project began during the fervor of the protests when Instagram became a platform for sharing information and resources and venting rage. This is a quote from Sean. People were angry and sad and frustrated. Canty tells Curb, all those feelings and emotions are valid, but I wanted to put some positive energy out into the world for everyone. What began as a handful of creatives he knows and admires became a list of a hundred. Then people who came across his stories began submitting suggestions and notes of appreciation for the project. Eventually, the list mushroomed to 200 people. This, this is a personal project done in a short period of time. It, it expanded on my own community and hopefully others as well, Canty said. There are so many other voices to include and stories to recover. The list is certainly not exhaustive. With that, I want to welcome Sean Canty. Sean, welcome. 
Um, thank you, Andrew, for the um, really thoughtful um, introduction. Um, I also would like to thank the Weizmann School of Design for this invitation to speak and share some of my work. Um, it's a pleasure to be giving this lecture at UPenn um, as a fellow Philadelphian. Um, it was here as a high school uh, senior that I enjoyed many public lectures at your institution um, and uh, this institution as, 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 as well as a few others in the city um, um, during those formative years really piqued my interest in pursuing a career in design. Um, the work that I have uh, been pursuing through my um, own personal practice, um, Studio Shankanti, is derived from, um, as Andrew mentioned, um, an interest in the thoughtful engagements um, between building typologies and geometries. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and this ranges from small scale projects like accessory dwelling units, um, to residents of low and high resolution, um, to research into um, irregular urban infills for um, large-scale collective housing. Um, the work of the studio is also inspired by both the ordinary and the exception, um, as well as the intimate and the playful. Um, moments of collectivity and gathering are explored in the context of domesticity, including typological investigations around the courtyard and negative space as well as the interplay between perspectival geometries and domesticity. More recently, I've been looking at how the combination of existing architectural typologies with new geometries can leverage traditional construction methods like clapboard siding, brick barrel vaults, solar panels, um, or standing seam metal siding. Um, my current interest in geometry begins with um, by revisiting the role of conic surfaces within stereotomic projections. Um, this research serves as a, uh, as a means to, um, this research did serve as a means to approximate and rationalize doubly curved surfaces, um, let's say in the case of Guarini's development of a torus um, by intersecting it with a series of cones. Um, here on the right, we can see the plan of a toroidal um, vault um, in which a series of, of um, uh, intersections between the, the torus and the, the torota vault um, are a means to kind of develop and describe the surfaces of this complex geometry. Um, by stereotomic projections, I'm also referring to types of orthographic drawings that have the kind of concision of information and measurement. Um, stereotomic projections also use few lines as possible in order to compress a lot of information onto one sheet of paper. Um, formally, I'm also really interested in how piecing together conical geometry can choreograph new figures from a single shape, and also to allow for the oscillation between two different readings of one thing, between the smooth and the coarse, between the axial and the rotational, and between the line and circle. Uh, I'm also interested in the cone for different kinds of, let's say, geometric adjacencies embedded within it. Um, it is perspectival in nature, widening at the base and terminating at a point. There are also adjacencies between point, line, and circle, and adjacencies of curvature, what one might call stretch circles, the hyperbola, parabola, and ellipse. The use of conical geometries on the one hand um, is a reaction to a kind of degree of formal complexity that digital tools allow the architects to create and post-rationalize. Um, but by working with these geometries in particular ways, one can achieve a high degree of formal complexity that is still amenable to construction methods. Um, I'm also interested in this question of adjacency or conjunction between curves and curves and between curves and lines. And also the way in which geometry choreographs certain programmatic explorations situating new adjacencies between programs and forms. Um, so this evening I'll be showing you some recent work organized in the category of pavilions and houses. Um, sorry, uh, the pavilions are proto-architectures, abstractions that are rehearsals in form, representation, and a way of positioning the work. And these explorations um, explore the potential of the ordinary and known geometries and their subtle transformation to produce newness. Um, the first investigation, Anomalous Corners, started by way of revisiting Robin Evans seminal text, Drawn Stone, and his reconstruction of the, the Trump at Annette Castle and his book, The Projective Cast. 
In this text, Evans relates the role of drawing and representation in the formal and material assembly of stone within the 18th century. In this particular instance, the techniques of stereotomic projection offered the architect methods to understand, describe, and produce new formal compositions within masonry. Key to this investigation of the trump is a displayed conical surface which supports um, a small tower. The trump at a net castle designed by the architect and geometer uh, Philibert de Lorme leveraged the knowledge of two codes, that of the architect and that of the stonemasons to arrive at its exceptional form. Um, this developed surface drawing of the Annette Trump illustrates the salient features of conical geometry, its developability, the ability to unroll flat, and a formal complexity enabled by the movement between two-dimensional space and three-dimensional form. Um, here, we might speculate that the drawnness of drawn stone is how Delorme handled the edge of the Annette Trump, constructing a squiggle, a doodle, a sketchy edge, a continuous gesture, or compound curvature and tangencies, materializing drawing by means of projection. As an elaboration of this technique, I decided to explore my own anomalous corners, substituting the Lorme's misbehaved edge for misbehaved compositions of trumps and their supporting towers. Each occupies a corner in a unique way, leveraging geometric tangency to smear, rub out, and blend the cylinders into the flatness of a corner. And these produce arrangements which are paradoxically protruded and negated at once. Um, this final drawing begins to suggest uh, material organization um, through the density of line weight and line type in order to suggest a method of curved or flat panelization. In the next project, the Follett Pavilion, um, this was uh, initially designed for a invited competition organized by materials and applications in LA. Um, and since then, I've evolved this exploration to another site and program, although the scale is similar to the initial competition proposal. Um, the competition called for explorations of how construction methods um, may inform uh, design techniques. Um, the proposal was inspired by the long history of turret or conical construction within the American building stock. Um, while turrets um, are typically adjacent to a building container, um, the Follett Pavilion makes this auxiliary element integral to the design. Um, so misalignments between the type and geometry um, happen by the large um, conical turret, by embedding the large conical turret within the vernacular shed container. Um, asymmetry and hierarchy are introduced through a subtle distortion of the plan um, in which three openings um, that are relatively similar in size and one that is at the scale of the door. Um, the plan also gestures towards both the axial and rotational by way of four pinwheeling walls which support the round tour at above. In the final plan, you can see the space has a small simple program with a semicircular bench for seating a reflecting pool that can be covered to, to facilitate perform, a performance space, and four supporting walls that are a combination of stud and metal framing, while the tourette is, was conceived as a stressed skin. As one moves around the pavilion, each object, the shed or the tourette, is revealed in varying ways, framing and including each other. From above, the gable roof appears to be in, in an entanglement um, like between Jada Pickett and Will Smith, or maybe a commingling of Will and Grace. Um, there are also two sibling, sibling oculi, one in the shape of a teardrop and one in a wedge shape that chor choreographs light into the space below. Um, this particular developed surface drawing shows how those figures were described and inscribed in 2D and then projected back onto 3D. From the exterior, what you aren't seeing is what um, is, is more important than what you are. Um, so what you aren't seeing is that there are two sets of oculi, one inscribed into the gable and the other inscribed into the cone. They work together to pull light into the interior. What you see is not quite what you get. If you look at the other side of the pavilion, you can see um, the moment where the gable um, begins to tuck into the interior of the turret and how material siding might bring continuity between the interior figure and the exterior shed. 
Um, the playful pavilion creates a small room for an informal gathering, performances and conversations. Inside, light is directed through three large exterior openings that are cut into the shed. And then lastly, in this image, um, shows the engagement of the oculi from both the interior of the pavilion. Uh, the house has explored the simulation of different spatial experiences of everyday living spaces um, through non-everyday shapes. Um, geometries are placed to transform familiar typologies towards something unfamiliar. And the uh, house has also deployed a different technique of tendency, um, one that allows for the apposition of, or fusion of dissimilar shapes and plan, as in the case of Piranesi's Campo Marzio in which the radical juxtaposition of form and type are extremely packed to form a new urban imaginary for the city of Rome. Uh, the first house I'd like to show today is the Janus House, um, which contains two residences in a single volume. Um, the plan of the Janus House arrives at its composition by merging key traits of two recognizable, recognizable housing types in a single volume. Um, the axiality on the one hand of the, of the dog trot house and the centrality of a courtyard house. Um, the house's twin logic is established through the transformation of the dog trot. Um, the dog trot is characterized by a covered open space and two gabled wings. And while the dog trot is inherently symmetrical in plan, the Janus house signals this organization, but it, it's immediately altered. Um, public spaces are concentrated towards the front of the house, while the two residences are concentrate, um, concentrate their private spaces towards the rear of the house. Um, the two residences occupy a left and right wing, whose boundary line is blurred by the relationship of public spaces and the connection of the courtyard. The, insert the insertion of the circular courtyard complicates the didactic parity of the dog trot plan and introduces a richness into the house's spatial experience. The sublimation of this typological feature in geomet geometric plasticity is in the first of a set of Baroque techniques applied to the American house forms, exaggerating and contorting primitive forms, which emphasize the parts within the whole and restrain introversion, which conceals the relationship of interior spaces. Historically, these sensibilities drew attention to the Baroque orchestration of mass and volume, as well as the play between light and shadow. One of the main differences between the Janus house and a typical dog trot house is that there is no open breezeway between the two house fronts. Instead, the gable volumes pinch together to zero at the front elevation, first compressing the formerly open space, then replacing it by a shared conical awning as though interior and outdoor spaces were collapsed by a compressive force. The circular courtyard reads as an almost execution of a literal throughway caught at the end of an acute angle and plan. In this way, the courtyard acts, as a, acts in tandem with the exteriorized dog trot at the front awning. Together, both typologies enable, enable a mixture of organizational gestures between center and edge. The courtyard is also shared programmatically by the two residences. Both bedrooms look out into the courtyard as well as other public and private spaces. The next house I'd like to show you um, actually is called, the, it's called the Roundhouse, and this is a work in progress um, for a prototypical home um, using stressed skins and cross-laminated timber. Um, as usual, this house starts with a cone, um, and in particular, this house is designed through the process of folding um, a circular figure in order to produce implied subdivision in the plan um, through this formal operation. This subdivision also helps to organize two resonances within the same volume. Um, here we can see that the cone is folded successive, successively onto itself, um, producing a disc that has a series of ridges. Um, this was done a number of times, producing different kinds of conical folds with different levels of intensity. Um, those conical folds are then intersected with planar folds um, that then produce a patterning on the surface of the geometry. And so from these tests, um, we developed a final version that concentrates um, formal complexity in two moments in two key moments. Um, conceptually, this house is defined by two horizontal planes, the roof and the ground plane. 
This also acts as a metaphor for the logic of assembly, where the house's walls are sandwiched between the ground plane and the stretched skin roof. The figural fidelity is concentrated towards the roof as a defining element, but the rest of the spatial division kept relatively simple. As with a lot of the previous work, this project considers the role of stressed skins in enabling curvature through traditional building practices alongside balloon framing and CLT blanks. Um, and I'm also I'm currently investigating the potential use of cross laminate tim timber within this project. Um, the, roof, the roof remains slightly oversized to provide a generous porch around the exterior of the building. Um, the wraparound porch also provides a kind of level of privacy that is distinct from the shared central courtyard. Um, familiar levels of privacy in, uh, between the exterior and interior um, are inverted. Um, inside the building, the building inside the building, um, there's a kind of rotational symmetry that organizes the plan um, around the central courtyard. The public, private, the public and private spaces of the two residences alternate in plan. And the fenestration in the courtyard and on the exterior of the building play with the expansiveness, expansiveness of views in both orientations of the project, um, contrasting the panorama versus the picture window. And then these are some, um, some test renderings I'm here of be between the kitchen and living room. I'm looking through the, the courtyard um, and then the dining, uh, living room and kitchen. Um, and like due to the curvature of the, uh, the form, um, sometimes roomness is defined by, by the concavity or convexity of the circle producing zones rather than, um, through subdivisions of, of walls. Um, the next project that I'd like to show is the Concord house. Um, this project draws its name from both this location and formal um, and programmatic concordance um, between disparate geometries and disparate subjects. Um, the house is situated at a corner lot in which the property lines are not parallel. And thinking about the packing of three residences into a single volume, the main move was to think about um, introducing a degree of uh, separation and connection. Um, and then this is made possible by introducing a kind of um, interior commons um, for, um, for the three residences. Um, geometrically, the commons takes the form of a circle, which contains a series of negotiating centers. Um, one center is an off-axis circle, which makes way for access to the second level. Um, and then there's a circular stair connecting both levels of the commons, which is the third center. Um, the entrances to each wing are placed um, tangently to the circular commons. As a result, the two wings of the house are able to rotate around the commons to align in parallel with the respective edges. Lot edges, sorry. Um, three distinct residences organize the building inside the volume. The residences share um, formal and organizational logics, um, but they kind of vary in scale. So on the left, um, there's a, a two-story residence with its own internal staircase. On the right is a self-contained um, larger flat. Um, and then upstairs is, a, uh, is the second floor of the two-story residence, as well as a third and smaller flat on the right. I'm at the roof. The commons is articulated through a gable figure that tucks into the roof um, in two distinct ways. And then this also produces um, connection to the exterior. As you move around the house on the exterior, you can see the conjunction of axial and centralized figures that make up the overall volume. The front facade bends, um, uh, the front facade subtly bends and contorts um, the convex exterior, while the elevation along the back produces a concave corner. And then these are some um, exterior perspectives. I'm looking at the front entry. Uh, and then this is uh, a perspective at the back. Um, and then inside the commons, we can see how the nested circulatory figures are concealed and revealed in various ways. Um, so here we can see the, the circular staircase that connects the um, upper and lower level of the commons. Um, and then that second staircase that um, provides entry to the upper level uh, flat. 
These are some interior perspectives. Um, the last and final project that I'd like to show today is um, the Barrel House. Um, this project started with the iconographic arch, um, which is used as a means to produce um, subdivision and plan and subtle spatial distortions and section. The spine of the house is defined by two barrel vaults and a series of thick walls. Um, and the rooms or the areas in the house are articulated through four tangent planes that slope between the central barrel vaults and the perimeter wall. And from the exterior, these sloping planes are visible above and between the thick um, um, exterior walls. And so in this first image, you can see um, the ent entrance hit positioned here, um, kind of off center. And here we can see the uh, one of the two short elevations of the house um, in which we can see the uh, how the barrel vaults are inscribed into one of the thick walls producing a kind of um, deep embrasure And um, in the plan, the house is organized into four quadrants. Um, there's a quadrant for living, a quadrant for sleeping, and a quadrant for making art, um, and a quadrant for guests. Um, these quadrants are um, connected by in-between spaces, um, which sit somewhere in between a room and a corridor in scale. Um, and these are spaces for um, kind of quiet and solitary work. Um, inside these in-between spaces are also defined by archways. Um, these archways act as deep embrasures that are um, sometimes less about light, but more about, um, less about view, sorry, but more about bringing light into the interior of the house. And these archways also resonate with punctures on the exterior facade um, that encompass um, the windows at both ends of the house. And so um, here we can see uh, the study beyond. Um, and, and here we are in the study um, looking towards the, the studio. Thank you.